A key application of probability is in statistics. There are three key components in statistics, namely sampling, hypothesis testing, and correlation and regression. We'll start with hypothesis testing. We'll ask a simple question. Did your schoolmates do worse in the recent examination? You've always known that they've scored around 70 marks, but when they left the exam hall, everybody felt dejected. You propose an alternate hypothesis that the average has decreased less than 70. How do you go about checking whether this claim holds up or not? We'll first assume that the null hypothesis, that is, the status quo, is true. We'll go ahead to collect some data, calculate the probability that if the null hypothesis is true, that is, the average remained at 70, we would have obtained the data that we would collect. And whether this probability is small or not, we will reject the status quo or not. But more on that later. We'll first assume that the null hypothesis is true. You decide to collect test scores from 30 of your schoolmates. These schoolmates are purely randomly chosen schoolmates. But one thing we do know is that if the null hypothesis is true, then the average score remains at 70. You want to collect 30 of these scores, add them up and divide by 30. From our previous video in probability, this follows a normal distribution approximately via the central limit theorem. This is our probability model and we're going to put it aside for just a moment. Let's go ahead to collect some data. And suppose your school has 200 students. You could randomly choose 30 of these students and ask them for their test scores and use this as your data. But you could have used other choices of 30 students. You've decided to do it in such a way that every student has an equal probability of being chosen. This allows your sample to be representative of the population. So once you've chosen 30 students, you can uncover their scores and calculate the empirical mean of these scores. This is known as an unbiased estimate of the population mean. And by adding all the numbers up and dividing by 30, small x bar has the value 68.1. Furthermore, we have two equivalent formulae to calculate the variance of the sample. In the second formula, 139211.5 is obtained by adding up all of the squares of the scores. We'll obtain a sample variance of 2.7733. Unlike x bar, s sub x squared is not the unbiased estimate of the population variance. To obtain this unbiased estimate, we need to multiply by a correction factor. We can run through the formulae using 139211.5 and 2043 once again to obtain s squared equal to 2.8690. This is the unbiased estimate of the population variance. These two pieces of data help us approximate what the population mean is likely to be as well as what the population variance is likely to be. With the data at hand, we can now calculate the probability that this data would be obtained if the mean score remained at 70 marks. To do that, we can use s squared as an approximate of the population variance since s squared is an unbiased estimate of the population variance. Under the null hypothesis, the mean of the sampling distribution is 70. This now allows us to calculate the probability that we would have obtained 68.1 or something more drastic. We call this the p-value, which represents the probability of obtaining our data. This evaluates to 4.0242 times 10 to the negative 10, an astronomically small number. The idea is that if this probability is really, really small, that means the probability of obtaining this piece of data is really, really unlikely, which tells us that we can probably dispense with the status quo. But how small is too small exactly? 
The convention is to take 0.05, known as the level of significance. When we compare the p-value and the level of significance alpha, the p-value is smaller than the level of significance. Since the p-value is smaller than the level of significance, a sample mean of 68.1 is really, really unlikely, which means we have sufficient evidence to reject the status quo. This helps us conclude that the alternate guess is probably true. That is, our schoolmates actually did worse in this examination. Another use in statistics is in correlation. Consider the attractiveness of a young woman and the number of sims that are attracted to her. We collect the following bivariate data and observe that the points tend to trend upward. This is a positive linear correlation and that's how we qualitatively describe the possible relationship between the two variables. Suppose you find another collection where the trend is still in the increasing direction, but the gaps between the points are relatively smaller. Since the points are more bunched up together, we say that this scatter diagram has a stronger positive linear correlation, while the previous scatter diagram in green dots has a weaker positive linear correlation. On the other hand, we can measure how simpy a person is and how attractive he is in the eyes of others. We have this following scatter diagram, and the trend line is decreasing, which tells us that this is a negative linear correlation. Furthermore, if we obtain a separate set of data, which are more bunched up together, this negative linear correlation is stronger, while the scatter diagram involving the red dots has a weaker negative linear correlation. As a rather unrelated example, consider one's TikTok usage across the time in a day. If we obtain such a data point, it's not entirely obvious whether this data point trends upward or downward. In this case, we just say that there is negligible linear correlation. Returning to the prettiness and the number of suitors example, let's consider this scatter diagram. How can we describe this correlation quantitatively? One thing's for sure is that we would like to draw a line that in some sense is a best fit for the scatter diagram. However, there are many lines that we could choose. What do we mean by best fit? How can we define it in a rather rigorous manner? We could measure the distances between each point and the trend line, calculate the errors, and square them to obtain a total error. As you change the line, you're going to obtain many different total errors. The best fit line is going to be the line that allows this total error to be minimized. You could try many different lines, but eventually we would settle on a line that minimizes the error. This is known as the least squares method in linear correlation because we're finding the line of least squares. Furthermore, it's also possible to find a number that summarizes the degree of the correlation between the prettiness of a young woman and the number of suitors. This is known as the correlation coefficient, denoted by R, and in this case, it has the value 0.96632. This number is relatively close to 1, and we can say that the linear correlation is strongly positive. However, if we were to plot a scatter diagram between the amount of time that elapsed and the number of viral infections, it does not seem to follow a straight line trend. What's the solution? One thing's for sure is that this curve looks a lot like an exponential curve, which also makes sense because infections tend to spread at an exponential rate. This allows us to guess that the curve that would best fit these points follows the equation y equals to a times b to the x. However, the techniques we've derived so far only works for straight lines. Can we convert this to a straight line? Turns out that if we were to apply the logarithm on both sides, we would obtain an equation that looks a lot like a straight line. We can therefore transform the variables logarithmically, and this allows us to obtain what seems to be a straight line. We can use our least squares method to obtain the regression line and even obtain the equation itself. Doing a bit of algebra, we can obtain the equation of the original curve. And if we were to plot it on the graph, 
it seems to be a relatively good fit. This helps us deal with nonlinear correlation, which underlies regression analysis. These are the two key ways that we can apply statistics at the A-levels in a nutshell.